Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday. I am trying to record without waking the toddlers, so that is why I am in this space again. And so here we go. Let's begin with a word of prayer. O oh God, on this day, you open the hearts of your faithful people by sending into us your Holy Spirit. Direct us by the light of that Spirit, that we may have a right judgment in all things and rejoice at all times in your peace, through Jesus Christ, your Son and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Chapters 1 through 21. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each of them heard speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, 
Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does it mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I shall show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There ends the reading.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the risen Christ. Amen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday to us. Happy birthday, dear us, the church. Happy birthday to us. That's right. Today is Pentecost, the birthday of the church. You know, I've been thinking lately a lot about relationships and in this time of pandemic and being cooped in and not being able to see each other the way we uh, certainly would like and what we're used to and and just it heart breaks for folks whose loved ones have passed away and they couldn't be there or in the hospital or nursing homes. We lift all those folks up in prayer every single day. Um, but relationships and, and how do we maintain relationships, especially when we don't have that face-to-face, -face, that physical contact? And it got me to thinking not just about that kind of relationship, but our relationship with God. And so in the context of Pentecost, I'd like, to, I'd like for us to kind of take a faith checkup today, if you will. What are the dramatic signs of a healthy faith? What are the dramatic signs of a healthy faith? It's a good question to think about on Pentecost. So here's number one, question number one for us. First of all, do you have a healthy relationship with God? Do I have a healthy relationship with God? Uh, think about that. How is your relationship with God right now? Is it wonderful? Is it alive? Is it well? Is it healthy? Or is it unhealthy? You know, some of us, some folks have a relationship with God based on fear and guilt. They say, I'd better shape up and obey the rules or else God is going to get me, punish me. That's really an unhealthy approach to faith because it makes God the bad guy. And what we know from scripture, page after page, is that God is not the bad guy. Instead, he's our best friend. He's out to find us. He's out to save us and bring us safely back into his loving arms. What a friend we have in Jesus, right, is a pretty precious hymn. Other folks have a relationship with God based on self-interest. They, they might say, I'd better be good so that God will reward me in the here and now, give me, in other words, what I want, right, and then let me go to heaven later. That too is a bit of an unhealthy approach to faith because it regards God as nothing more than kind of like a heavenly Santa Claus, right? And we better watch out. We better not cry, better not pout. I'm telling you why. God's keeping a list. God's keeping a list. And so when we do good, that's great. When we do bad, he punishes us. And according to scripture, that's not the way God works at all. One of my favorite sections in scripture is John chapter 14, and Jesus has just finished washing the disciples' feet. And he says to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, for I go to prepare a place for you. Now, the, the back half of that initial part of chapter 14 is the disciple Philip, whom we don't hear much about in the New Testament, just a couple of times. But Philip raises his hand and says, Lord, we will trust you. We will believe in you if you would only just show us the Father. And you can imagine Jesus just shaking his head, taking a deep breath, deep sigh, and saying, Philip, where have you been for three years? Don't you know that when you see me, you see the Father? When you see what I teach, what I do, the healings, don't, don't you know that I am an expression of the Father? I am the Father. The Father and I are one. Jesus showed us dramatically that God loves us graciously, compassionately, sacrificially, unconditionally. So God is not some unfeeling, uncaring person who's writing down all the lists of the good things and the list of the bad things. And if he was doing it for me, the bad list would be a whole lot longer than the good list. But rather, he's our living Lord who comes to redeem us, to save us, to reclaim us, to draw us back where we belong. And that is in his loving arms. Relationships with God based on fear or guilt or self-interest are basically unhealthy. They're flawed from the very beginning because, you see, a healthy relationship with God is based on trust. We do our best and trust God for the rest. 
That's what Pentecost is all about. It's that celebration of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that God is with us and we trust him. You know, think back to Christmas, which quite frankly seems like a decade ago. But think back to Christmas. One of the things every Christmas we celebrate is that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. So God's promise to us throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, is to never abandon us, to never leave us, to always be with us, to always be by our side, to give us the strength for what we need when we need it. That promise is a good thing. It's a good thing for you. It's a good thing for me. It's a good thing for us as the body of Christ to remember. Now, Moni, a, a Christian conference speaker of some repute, shared this following event in her life. Nell and her husband, Ralph, they had two sons. Their youngest son, Rick, was in a terrible accident at the age of 21. And for five days, they walked the floor of the hospital and in uh, Tennessee, hoping and praying that Rick would make it. And for five days, the doctors were very encouraging. They thought he would pull through, turn the corner. But then things turned the other way, and tragically, Rick died, just 21 years old and gone. Nell's husband was a pastor, and when the memorial service was held on that next Sunday afternoon, the sanctuary was just full of people, jam-packed, shoulder to shoulder. The whole city was in grief. That following Sunday morning, Nell went to church all by herself. Her husband was in the pulpit. Her oldest son had gone off to college. Rick had been living at home and had gone to a, was going to a local college, and he always went to church with his mom. And he always sat next to her, but now he was gone. And so Nell went to church that morning all by herself. She said walking into church all by herself that Sunday morning after Rick's funeral was the hardest thing she's ever had to do in her life, hands down. And just before she walked into the sanctuary, she prayed, Oh God, please be with me. Please be with me. Please give me the strength I need to do this. Oh Lord, please be with me. And she walked in and she sat in her usual place and out of habit she moved over and left a place open on the aisle, the place where Rick always sat. And she looked at that empty spot and it was almost unbearable. She felt so alone. And just then there was a movement beside her. She looked over to see a little nine-year-old girl slip into that seat. The little girl reached over and held Nell's hand, and all through the service, every now and then, the little girl would pat Nell's hand and say, I love you, Mrs. Moni. I love you, Mrs. Moni. Nell Moni said that she felt the presence, she had felt the presence of God with her many, many times in her life. And that morning when, he, when she needed him more than ever, he was there. He was with her right then and there in the spirit and love and thoughtfulness of a little nine-year-old girl. And telling that story, Nell was showing us that she had a healthy relationship with God, right? a relationship built on trust, not on fear or guilt or self-interest, but rather on doing your best and trusting God for the rest. And that's also the kind of trust Simon Peter must have had when he stood up to preach on that first day of Pentecost. Oh God, please help me. Oh God, please help me. Give me the words to say. Because remember, this is the same guy who'd been hiding in an upper room. Same guy who had denied Jesus three times. Same guy. And now he's up in front of everybody in Jerusalem. His first sermon was in front of half a million people. Wow. And you know what? God was with him. God's spirit blew through him in that place. God gave Peter the right words to say, the courage to say them, and 3,000 people were baptized, all because Peter did his best and trusted that God would do the rest. Let me ask you something, and believe me, I'm asking myself the same question. Do you trust God like that? Do you? Do you have a healthy, wholesome vibrant relationship with God built on trust in him. 
Okay, that's the first question. The second question is this. Do you have, do we have a re healthy relationship with other folks? Barbara Brown Taylor, who is a fam uh, pastor and she writes lots of commentaries, she tells the story of a 97-year-old woman who's having trouble now with her short-term memory, but she remembers everything from years and years and years ago. So this gal told Barbara of a time when she was a child that she and her girlfriends decided to climb up Mount Washington in New Hampshire. They had a wonderful time, but they stayed too long. So darkness and fog came in quickly and it got cold and windy. They had no flashlights, so they ended up holding each other's hands and moving down the mountain together, kind of in a human chain. They sometimes argued which path they would take, but regardless of which one they took, they never let go of one another. And the woman concluded by saying, it was so dark and foggy, sometimes all I, all I could see was the hand behind me, the hand in front of me. We made it by holding on to one another. And friends, that's why the church is so crucial. That's why the church is so crucial even now, even in the midst of a pandemic, even when we haven't face-to-face -face seen each other in a while. That's why the church is so important because it gives us the community to hold on to, a hand behind us, a hand in front of us, but also especially a hand above us. And even more than that, Pentecost today reminds us that all of us in the world are family. You know, on that Pentecost day, the text tells us there were people from all over the world in that city for that celebration. People speaking different languages, different cultures, different backgrounds, all were brought together that day by God's Spirit. And they communicated that day because of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The symbol that day was not a clenched fist to, to fight others off, but an open hand to take hold of one another and celebrate. Remember again what the 97-year-old woman she said. She said, we made it by holding on to each other. And that's our calling too, right? To see other people not as enemies or adversaries to be destroyed, but as brothers and sisters to hold on to. You know, we live in days of division. We have for the last number of years. You know, we're politically divided, Republican, Democrats, uh, arguments all the time over that. Even we're arguing now whether or not we should wear masks or not. Or if those who wear masks consider those who don't wear masks enemies and vice versa. Hopefully someday we'll learn the lesson. But for today, how is it with you? Do you have a healthy relationship with the Lord, trust in him? Do you have a healthy relationship with other folks built on love and respect? And, and lastly, there's this. Do you have a healthy relationship with yourself? With yourself. <clears throat> All the experts tell us that what is essential in loving others is, is to have wholeness, uh, wholeness a, a sense of wholeness in terms of self-esteem, a healthy love and respect for ourselves. I don't mean cocky. I don't, I don't mean, you know, uh, abrasively arrogant. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about feeling good about ourselves. We are much more likely to be happy and productive if we feel good about ourselves you know, you, you read all the studies and, and bullies and people who uh, mistreat other people are generally not real happy with themselves on the inside. We've known that. My parents told me that when I was growing up, right? But there is help from God in all this. There is help from God in all this. Because if we talk about self-esteem, self i got to tell you, Peter's self-esteem was shot. He denied Jesus three times. He went off running in the darkness, crying beside himself. He sat in that upper room and, and was just despondent. Talking about self-esteem or lack thereof. And even though Jesus rose again and appeared to him and found him and forgive him, forgave him, Still, his self-respect was not restored until fully, until the Holy Spirit came into him at Pentecost. After that, his confidence returned. He gave all the credit to God. And so, too, when the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts. And by the way, you have the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that was in Jesus and those disciples is in you and me. My problem, and probably our problem, too, our struggle is we tend to quench the Spirit. 
Sometimes we just don't let the Spirit loose. But the Spirit is there. I'm reminded <clears throat> uh, by Pastor James Moore that as the Holy Spirit comes in our hearts, what comes to mind is that famous hymn song uh, by Josh Groban. Oh God, you raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to be more than I can be. That, friends, is the way it works. When the breath of God breathes on us, it gives us a healthy relationship with God, a healthy relationship with each other, a healthy relationship with ourselves. That, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is what today, Pentecost, is all about. Amen.
Let us now enter into a time of confession and forgiveness. O oh God, you send the Holy Spirit to us in many ways, but we don't always listen. When our youth and oppressed people prophesy, we turn our heads and close our eyes. When old and young share dreams of a brighter future, we instead choose to stay with what's comfortable and familiar from our past. Grant us grace and forgiveness when we fail to let the Holy Spirit work through us. May we be your faithful, Holy Spirit-led people. Amen. People of God, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Our God is the God of grace and forgiveness, and we can rejoice because the Holy Spirit is here. The Spirit is at work around you. The Spirit is at work within you. God's Spirit will not be silenced or stopped, and God's Spirit brings good news for all the world. Amen. We remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and poured it out for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And he taught us how to pray. We pray that prayer together now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ, given for you. And the blood of Christ, shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
Christ's living body, let your flaming spirit surge. Where deceit conceals injustice, candle us to speak your truth. Candle us to speak your truth. God of earthquake, God of thunder, shake us loose from lethargy. Break the chains of sin asunder, Christ our Lord, make us one in Christ our Lord. God of passion, God of sleeping, stir in us love's restlessness. Where the people cry in anguish, may we share your heart's distress. Rouse us from content. We are so glad that you joined us here for worship at Christ Lutheran. Before we leave, just a reminder that we are having a Zoom uh, coffee fellowship hour at 1030. So please uh, hop on that. The link is in the description for this video. It's a great chance to see some faces that we love and miss during this time and to enjoy some fellowship in this face-to-face -face virtual way. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.